Stop what you're doing. You've now made the choice to listen to this podcast. The butterfly effect is in full swing. Who knows what terrible fate could befall you if you were to stop listening? Probably nothing, but who knows? Oh, all right, now that's that out of the way. That weight is off my shoulders. Let's get this thing going. Welcome to the Impact Factor. The Impact Factor is what happens when two scientists and two best friends get together to talk about video games. My name is Alex Samoha, and I'm joined this week, as I am every single week here on the Impact Factor, by that guy who is finally, folks, finally ended his stint as a part-time public access radio personality, my co-host, the man, the myth, the guy who is hopefully loud today, my co-host, Charles Fliss. Yeah, man! Oh, I'm excited. I'm glad to be back. I'm finally, finally home from vacation, which means I can get back to the serious business of video games. I am ready to record this podcast until dawn, if need be. Oh, ho, ho, ho. probably beyond that, because, uh, yeah, we got we got so much to talk about today. Yes, folks, my little intro there was about un- Until Dawn. It's a new Supermassive game, PlayStation 4 exclusive. This is a game I've been excited about for a long time. We'll maybe get to it at some point later in the future on the show, but basically, it's a teen horror slasher, choose-your-own-adventure game. I'm excited for that. It got surprisingly good reviews, so... Yeah, man, it looks awesome. Ask me if I'm ready. Uh, are, are, are Ask me if I'm ready. Uh, are, are you ready? Yeah, I'm ready. Let's do this. Oh, my God. The audio's going to spike there. Oh, yeah, man. Good luck editing that. This is this is what I want. Work Fliss. Vacation Fliss, he's way too busy. But then this is this is the Fliss. This is the Fliss that I could deal with. It's so funny because we were talking, and I'm like, oh, man, I can't wait till you're done with your vacation so you can get back to playing video games. Yeah, man, it was it was ridiculous. Traveling was awesome. I got to see so much of Japan. I got to do so many cool things, but not any of them were video games. You play you, you gunslinger Stratost? Yeah, okay, that and well, the arcade games. I mean, that's just yeah, I mean, that's I mean, like I mean, on a different plane. Uh, different, different plane here. Yeah, we're 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 not even having the same conversation anymore. <laughs> oh yeah, you bring you bring that unique perspective, and that's what we're here about in the Impact Factor. Unique perspectives. I don't know. I'm, gonna, I'm catching myself slipping into NPR. I'm gonna. Yeah, have to what, take what are you it doing here, man? We, you, you're gonna put everybody to sleep, and I just got woken up. I know. I know. You chug the energy drink. We're ready for this. We got a lot to talk about. Oh man. But the impact factors where I bring my perspectives as a biomedical scientist and combine them with and usually against Fliss's well, social scientist worldview to have great discussions about video games. Until Dawn is not in either of our hands, so let's get it started with some news and views. News and Views. In an academic journal, News and Views collects the best of recent events and findings. Here, Fliss and I scour through the week in video game news to find the stories with the biggest impact. Fliss, now that you've finally been at work, so had time to read a bunch of video game stories, (laughs) what you got? What's your story of the week? Alright, well, right here... I'm going to start out with our my most impactful story is Google launching its very own challenger to Twitch, YouTube Gaming. It's here. It's out. Well, it's out in the United States, but it's here. We are we are we're, we've got streaming through YouTube. They've, they've set it up, but uh, it's not exactly being received very well. Yeah, like anything, it's it's got a. I wouldn't say rocky. Uh, of a launch it seems to be pretty stable uh and seems to be pretty pretty fully featured uh, but there's certainly some issues we can touch on here but yeah this is youtube gaming i think it's gaming.youtube.com is how you get to this home page it's finally youtube has announced their gaming channel they announced it right before e3 uh because they had um at e3 they had a youtube gaming show which is they streamed a bunch of the e3 press conferences jeff Keeley, you know kind of the perpetual host of all video game things related <laughs> was on their stage. Uh, and yeah, so they kind of been teasing us for a long time, but it's finally launched. YouTube is going serious. I mean, you've been able to stream you, uh, gameplay on YouTube for a while now, and now they've kind of centralized it as this Twitch-like hub. Yeah, uh, and I, that launched the, us the other the day. Big, the big difference here, right, is that instead of having to kind of poke around the normal YouTube site to find your gaming content, to find streaming content... You now have it all centralized, like you said, and it, it just launched. Uh, it came out on the 26th in North yeah. America, mm-hmm. and I also believe it launched successfully in Europe as well. So 
I don't know, man. It's people. People aren't really happy with the UI, though. Yeah, so I've played around with the UI here. I've been to this gaming.youtube.com homepage, and it's kind of a mess. Uh, it's it's. I mean, I think there's beauty and simplicity, and uh, I think one of the things Twitch does very well is has such a simple interface and such everything is pre- kept pretty minimalistic. Uh, the homepage has a feature of like maybe five streams at a time, and then has a list of like the ten most streamed games at the moment. And then you can click on those games, and then you can find the streamers there. But then the search function is like pretty pretty easy, and you can search by games. But YouTube is like uh, there's a lot of stuff on the homepage. There is like a uh, any number of game images there, and you see like there's one spotlight and a bunch. But basically, it's just kind of confusing to to see exactly what's going on there. Yeah, man. I the the UI. I looked at it. I'm not thrilled with it. I like I like Twitch's setup. I mean, I'm a grumpy old man, so I don't like change for any UI. I just downloaded the new iTunes, and I despise it in every way. <laughs> Which one? The iTunes that released the new iTunes version that released two days ago, or the one that released four days ago, or the one that released eight days ago? I think it was the one that released like. Eight hours ago. Okay, yeah, that's 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 twelve point one point two point three point zero point one point. Yeah, I don't know. Point butthole. Those things. Yep, yep. That's <laughs> that's what it was. And I think they point changed, butthole. Point butthole. They changed my user icon. They took all the features out that I liked and made them hard to find or whatever. Anyway, point is, I don't like change. I don't like that this UI is kind of cluttered. You know, I like simple things because I like Blizzard games and because you're simple minded. <laughs> I, I don't. Gosh, Alex, I don't. I don't have a retort for that one. <laughs> gorsh, gorsh, Alex. Oh, oh man, I, I want to do South Park Mickey on here, but I don't think anyone else will enjoy that. <laughs> I don't know if even you would enjoy that. You would finish and then just kind of feel hollow on the inside. You know what else makes me feel hollow on the inside? The VODs. Oh yeah, so that's that's an issue too. So, I mean, what Twitch? I think needs a competitor. And the a market isn't healthy without competition, and so I'm I'm really happy that this YouTube gaming thing is coming. Uh, I'm glad that it's kind of it seems to have already. Uh, I mean, you have a ready, huge, ready amount of content because there's so many people on YouTube. Uh, but one of the things that's kind of if they're advertising this service as a streaming service, one of the things that clutters up the homepage and clutters up a lot of this YouTube gaming content are all these videos on demand or these vods are basically traditional YouTube content. And so, in the limited time that I've been kind of playing around with it, it was difficult for me to find, like, active streams of games I cared about. Uh, And I think that's the most important thing. Like, you know, I'm less so about the cult of personality on Twitch. I have certain, like, Hearthstone streamers that I'll tune into every once in a while because I enjoy their play. Uh, But more so, I just want to see a game at a certain point in time. I'm not like, so I'll, like, want, I'm like, oh, well, I want to see someone playing, I don't know, Galaxy stream. And I'll look that up, and I can find some and see people playing. And it doesn't really matter to me who's playing. But that's the thing that's kind of difficult right now, because there's so many links to, like, traditional VODs all over the homepage. And then even when you search on individual people's page, it's kind of like, it's cluttered. Yeah, yeah, I don't like that. And I agree. I think Twitch needs a competitor. A lot of people might feel a certain loyalty to Twitch, but competition will only make the site better. I mean, they will be forced to improve it and make it better for all of us. So competition is a good thing. I wish that the YouTube site were not so disappointing in such expected ways, right? It's it's too cluttered. It's too, like, ad-heavy, I guess I would say, because the, the VODs feel like ads to me in the way they clutter the page i i just i feel like if if google is on its way to being our skynet overlords i need to know that they're going to be competent and this does not inspire hope in that yeah yeah i mean it seems like from my experience with the youtube streaming service period it's a stable service and one of the things that people really dislike about twitch is like (laughs) the server like twitch has like some real major instabilities um for instance you know the whole like at the start of the international twitch crashed uh so uh those things happen and there's a lot of features and honestly seeing videos on demand are is much more difficult on twitch like you have to go to the channel you have to go to the person go to the channel go to the page go to the past archives and then unless they've highlighted it you're scrubbing through potentially several hour long things and it puts a lot of work on the streamer to create these videos on demand that are easily accessible so i think there's certainly it's certainly an important advantage for these youtube gaming 
But I think like everything else, they need to, need to sort out their hiccups, and they need this launch, and just to get people's feedback. Um, one of the things that uh, I think is a could be potentially a much bigger issue are these copyright issues that are coming up with this. Um, already, this YouTube gaming service doesn't work in Germany due to some weird copyright laws they have over there. And then people are getting really immediately and instantly shut down and flagged and you know warned for playing you know copyrighted music. Uh, especially, and that's one of the things that Twitch streamers do all the time. They'll have music playing in the background while they're playing a the game, and then a big part of being a part of a YouTube co- or a Twitch community is you can like there'll be these like community playlists that you know fans will like suggest and vote on songs, and then you have that interaction. But if that can't come to YouTube Gaming, it seems like such a minor thing, but I think it could end up being pretty significant if you can't have any kind of copyrighted content playing. Well, I think that this is very relevant to our discussion of iTunes because as we've learned before on YouTube. The, the recording industry, the music industry are buttholes and they're, they're going to keep <laughs> yeah. over policing content. And I don't know that there's anything that YouTube can do to control that, right? Because YouTube is not just invested in gaming as big of an industry as streaming is becoming. It's not as big as the amount of money that YouTube gets from people uploading music, from uploading things like uh, anime music videos from uploading other kinds of cuts and other kinds of home videos using music. And, you know, YouTube has to be very, very careful about the way it dances with copyright law. Yeah, it's a it's a dance of death, a tango of torment. It's a, it's a real shame we can't say a tango of trademark, because that would be really good. <laughs> yeah, tango of trademark. I think that's, you know, trademark copyright. I'm no lawyer. Yeah, They're the same thing. It's all, this, it's, ah. it's all that stuff that stops you from using words I want to and music I want to. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, so, I mean, honestly, this is a cool initiative. It's a big thing. I think something to keep your eye on. Uh, for those folks listening, the Impact Factor does have a YouTube gaming page. The formatting is completely garbage right now. I don't know what happened to our header image. Uh, but you can find us there, and maybe we'll stream there at some point. I guess I know what my project at work tomorrow is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You want to go in there and fix that, buddy? Well, I uh, set up our original YouTube. I guess I could try and set up our gaming <laughs> uh, Yeah, Figure it out and get back to me. All right, but I whoa, think... Whoa, 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 whoa. Of... Hold on. If anyone's okay. delegating anything, it's me delegating you to tell us about the next story. Okay, okay, okay. Um, but just to wrap this up. So we were talking about the YouTube gaming... Fliss, in one sentence, why do you think that was most impactful? One sentence, buddy. Am I allowed to use commas? No, no commas, no semicolons. Oh, come on, man. I love the semicolon. <laughs> you would love the semicolon. You and semicolon snuggling up at night. Why you gotta mock my semicolon body pillow? I mean, I'm not judging. I mean, people like semicolons. It's fine. I can hear the judgment in your voice. You'll never understand our love. <laughs> you mean, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a hyphen guy. I mean, hyphens... That's where it's at. I can't even look at you right now. <laughs> you know you want to, though. How do you know me so well? <laughs> All, All right, right yeah, so one, one sentence, sentence wrap-up. One sentence, our, our wrap-up. Why, why, t- why is YouTube gaming important? New streaming service that could change everything as a major competitor to Twitch. I'm not allowed to use commas. All right, <laughs> very good. <laughs> Though the, I'm not allowed to use commas. There must have been something there. Otherwise, it's some weird grammatical structure. <laughs> I'll let you figure that out. Why don't you talk to your hyphens about it? All right, my hyphens, my, they got my back. They're my boys and girls. Um, so my most impactful story is that Hearthstone's next expansion, their second expansion, their fourth ever big content release, the Grand Tournament, launched on Monday. I'm sorry, folks. We'll, be, we'll go through this fast. <laughs> maybe you're sick of hearing Hearthstone. Maybe you're not. Don't, don't lie to them. To There's again. no way we're going to go through this fast. Okay, no, you guys are going to have to deal with it for the weeks and months to come. There's This, in, this is going to be Hearthstone cast. I'm just saying, unless I get an email to impactfactorpodcast at gmail.com telling me to stop, I want to keep going. Because I'm going to assume you guys love this stuff. Um, so yeah, this big expansion came out. It's 132 new cards. Lots of craziness ensued. If anyone wants to check out our YouTube We'll we'll, 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 we'll we'll pimp it out at the end of the episode. I opened 81 packs from the new set. And, and how, how many how many legendaries did you open? Four. In 81 packs. Yeah, that's about average. There's a one every 20 is about the average, Man. statistically. Man, did, wh- which one was your favorite? Uh, Chilma. Great choice. <laughs> Though I don't want to spoil anything, but there is uh, some down-to-the-wire legendary opening that you guys have to please be excited for. 
Yes, please be excited to watch someone else open up virtual <laughs> packs filled with digital cardboard. The folks love it. The folks love it. Cracking them digital packs. Um, but yeah, so there's. I'm gonna pop ton- some packs. Only got. I'm done. The uh, you know you, you don't want to keep going with that. <laughs> well, I mean, I'm I'm clearly the one with only twenty dollars in their wallet since you could afford to buy eighty one packs. <laughs> yeah, maybe we shouldn't though. We're talking about copyright. Uh, so yeah, it's crazy. It's it's kind of breathed new life into it. Like any card game, you want to reinvigorate. You want to add new cards as often as possible. Um, well, as often, at as least reasonable. several times as a year, I think, to kind of keep things fresh. Uh, a lot of cool things. A lot of new decks are coming up. It's still a very dynamic time for Hearthstone. It's exciting. I've been trying decks. I've been sitting at work, and I'll be like, oh, crap, that's a deck, and I'll write it down, and then I get to play around with it. Um, but, yeah, there's a bunch of cool stuff there. It's Hearthstone is a crazy thing because Hearthstone is something that we know from Internal Blizzard uh, you know, dialogue and, and talk that they've shared with the community that Hearthstone was totally unexpected. The success of the game was totally unexpected. It started as a small um, offshoot. It's a small team. They weren't really, weren't really sure about what it, and it emerged into this huge, huge success, making $20 million a month, like we talked about, with 30-plus million registered users. People playing this game nonstop. It's a phenomenon. There's Twitch streamers. There's it's eSports talk. Hearthstone's huge. The Grand Tournament is huge. Fliss, have you had any experience with the Grand Tournament? Yeah, dude, I saved up. I have opened, I think, about 10 packs at this point. No legendaries out of the Grand Tournament. Shame, shame, shame. No luck. Never lucky. Man, my luck is in games is notoriously bad. <laughs> I, once, I once had to only... I had three dice against Patrick in a, a friend of ours in a, in a miniatures game and uh, I had three dice and I only needed to not roll triple ones that's all I needed to do was not roll triple ones the infamous triple snake eye yeah man that is a scary the three-eyed snake, snake. <laughs> so I, I roll them and of course triple ones and yet I can't open a legendary so, I know 10 packs isn't that much, but have you tried any, like, new decks? Have you been playing around with anything there? Yeah, you know, I'm well, mostly at this point, because I've only opened 10 packs, I, uh, I'm just kind of augmenting old decks. I'm kind of experimenting with things. My, um, I mean, my Paladin deck, right, that, that works on summoning lots and lots of the, uh, those little 1-1s one whose names some... Reporting for duty! Yeah, I somehow... With Silverhand recruits, right? Yeah, um, that's correct. That deck, that deck's a lot of fun, right? Because they just got better. Um, but certainly, watching you play some in spectator mode, uh, you're on a di- different level of deck creation than I am right now, just because you have more cards to work with. Yeah, that, I don't know if that's the only reason. That is definitely the only reason. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so this is really exciting. I mean, it's so cool that Hearthstone has kind of started from this small little. You know, small incubated project to something that's there's a huge team five is now a huge fully fleshed out team. They're making there's so, so many people play every day. It's a big esport. It's really cool. Uh, a couple interesting things that came out of uh, the grand tournament though. There people kind of looked through the code and they found a few lines um, uh, of script that indicated that maybe there might be some co op coming. There's a line like Ooh. you've. You two have defeated, like, you two two players win, or both defeated the boss. So it seems like there might be some, like, co-op adventure coming, Fliz. I would love that. I would love that, because I could just cruise next to you in your money bags decks. <laughs> exactly right. You just, I carry you through the raid. You're, you're my carry, man. You're my Sven. Oh, I'm svelte. I don't know about Sven. You are, well, you are not fat. I'll give you that. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks? <laughs> I guess. <laughs> no, man. Um, yeah, that's awesome. I would co-op would be great. Four v four would be, or excuse me, two v two would be awesome. That'd be that'd be really I, cool. I just think of nothing else. Like one of the things that like I enjoy their adventure modes, which are just these other expansions where you play against the it's a single player campaign. Almost you play against these bosses. You have these kind of f- boss fights where they have kooky kind of abilities. Uh, but you know, pretty much once you beat it once, you're kind of done with it um and you certainly don't get any more rewards and so i think it'd be cool to incorporate like the raiding element like the the boss dungeon raids um 
even more so into Hearthstone. And maybe if you could team up with another person, you could face harder versions of the boss or get rewards, or you could keep fighting these bosses again and again to have like extra stuff. I think there's a lot of cool opportunities for playing two player. Uh, and I certainly, I would assume that this is, if this is, you know, legit, and if this is going to come, it's almost certainly going to be, at first at least, just two people versus an AI. Yeah. Because I'm sure it gets extremely complicated when you're a 2v2 player, is like ma- finding the matchmaking and getting that set up, like that's got to be a nightmare. Yeah, no, I mean, absolutely. And just, even just co-op campaign would be great. And yeah. for anybody who's out there, now is a tough time to get into Hearthstone, um... There's been a lot of really good stuff written about that, uh, but it's still worth checking out because, especially as a new player, you can still do some things. You can open some cards, and if you're not out to be a top-level player, you can still have a lot of fun. Yeah, you mentioned that. Uh, we saw we saw kind of a, a little bit of a backlash with the Grand Tournament. Uh, you linked a story uh, that kind of or you linked a, a thread that kind of expands upon this. Fliss, do you want to touch on that a little bit? Yeah, yeah, this is a thread from Reddit, um, the the Hearthstone board, and uh, it's just kind of talking about some of the problems that new players have catching up at this point, because we're, we're now two expansions in with two single-player adventures that also give you cards that are very necessary for the top-level play, and uh, fundamentally... What this thread does is not just mention these problems, not just mention that, you know, there are so many cards now that as a new player, unless you're willing to spend a huge amount of money, you can't catch up without grinding a lot, which is like the classic free-to-play problem. It doesn't just say that. It also gives what I think is a very reasonable and interesting suggestion for make for solving this problem, which is reducing the dust cost, reducing the cost um, in cards that you've discarded to create dust to create new cards right so for the older cards i'm being i want to make this as clear as i can the each card has all cards right now have a certain dusting cost right where you can scrap cards and create new cards using this dust and what this thread suggests is that from cards from older sets like the classic set or goblins versus gnomes reduce the cost the uh the dust cost of these cards make them easier to create on your own basically so with fewer packs, you can make more of the older good cards. Yeah, agreed, agreed. I mean, something is has to be done, I think, within the next e- at least a year, if not six months, because it is intimidating to get good. And I know, I mean, Hearthstone is a very casual game. I feel like most people play incredibly casually, and so it's really not an issue for, our, I'm, I'm certain, almost a huge portion of the player base. But for those who are at least more than have, like, a passing interest are actually do take the time to sit down and play sometimes it can feel really frustrating when it's like well i you know i need to put money in otherwise i'm gonna fall extremely behind on the card pool and that's not not necessarily a great feeling and i know that some people defend it saying like oh it's a card game it, i mean i've said this myself you know it's the cheapest card game i've ever played it's the, you know, the cheapest collectible card game i've ever played by you know and in lo- a log scale um but still, it's a video game, so they have inherent advantages, and I think they need to not just be like, well, it's a card game, people are used to paying a premium to stay on top of all the cards and the content. They need to take a step back and be like, we, we have the opportunity to make this easier to get into for new players. Because um, I don't want to get to the point where, you know, you have to drop, you know, potentially 100 or $200 you know, a year on the game just to stay on top of stuff. Because then it's just like every other card game where it starts getting increasingly expensive and frustrating, so... We'll see. Yeah, man, one, one thing that came up in those comments uh, in that thread that I thought was really good is that people were saying, well, you know, at some point, right, like the player base will stop expanding at a satisfactory rate. And that's probably when Blizzard will actually take a look at what we can do to make this more accessible. Yeah, fair. I mean, they're making a lot of money off of it. So don't change something until <laughs> they start you know, seeing a dip in that income. Yeah, man. Awesome. So, hey, I want to tell you about, uh, well... Actually, before I do that, recap. Let's do let's, let's scientists conclude in yeah, conclusion. Yeah. Uh, Tell me, the grand tournament is important. Why is the uh, okay. grand tournament important? This is your turn. The grand tournament is important because Hearthstone is one of the largest and fastest growing, easy free to play games, and the grand tournament expands that. There was definitely a comma in that sentence. No, you can, I can do that without a comma. Yeah, but it would be bad grammar. <laughs> well, I mean, you know me. Your own mom said it sounded like I was a non-English speaker <laughs> in my writing. So. You were a high schooler at the time. 
you know, people never change. I was going to say, but, you know, then again, you know, you majored in the, the, the quote-unquote hard sciences, so I'm sure that uh, put, it's a miracle you can put a few sentences together on paper. Me talk good? No, Alex. <laughs> you know talk good. All right, what's your next story? All right, man, well, I'm going to take us back to YouTube um, for a scandal. Ooh, I like scandal. Yeah, man, so we've got some YouTubers playing games on their channel, getting excited about the games, not disclosing that they have a financial stake in how the game performs. Yeah. All right, run, run, run through the situation quickly. Okay, um, so we have Syndicate and CNanners worked and made videos for the game Dead Realm. And the, the they, get, they put it on their channel, they're playing it, they're like, oh, this game is good. And the problem is that on some videos, they acknowledge that, hey, we're part of the development group for this game. We're, we're part of the crew promoting and um, working on making this game. But in other videos, they didn't clearly acknowledge it. And while... You know, if you follow them closely, you'll be aware of this. If you're just kind of clicking on videos, this you might not know that they're aware of it. Now, obviously, YouTubers have a huge influence on how games do, and companies have been trying to kind of get their claws in succeeding in many cases of getting their claws into YouTubers to promote games. But this, at this point, this has to be very clearly defined. And so now there's an FTC investigation pending, there's a risk that there could be a lawsuit, but more importantly, it brings up the much, much bigger issue that YouTubers playing games can be deceptive, that they can be advertising and not unbiased opinions. And so critically evaluating how your YouTuber chooses their games, how they play their games is a... Uh, more important than ever. I mean, I don't actually really watch many people play on YouTube, but I know it's a big thing in the community. So, what about you? Do you watch people play <laughs> so, on YouTube? To, to, so, to summarize your story, uh, does it affect me? And I don't know about it, but I'm mad. Hey, man, I'm a person of the internet. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. You sound like everyone else. Uh, I did actually. I've spent a lot, a lot of time watching YouTubers play. In fact, back in college, I did used to watch Cnanners. Uh, he played Call of Duty. Um, that's when I was big into my Modern Warfare 2 Black Ops phase, and so I'd watch gameplay videos and... A dark time in your was life. my... Yeah, a dark time. The dark times. I was <laughs> crawling around, my hands and knees. Still on the seabed. <laughs> yeah, still on the seabed. The primordial soup. Looking at the, the sun, darkened by the leagues of ocean water on top of me. I don't know. I don't know where I'm going with this. But yeah, so I, I have watched that, and I do I do appreciate the content they produce. But this is, I, I like exactly like you said, this is a growing problem for the YouTube scene. Um, this is a thing that uh, they call in the, in the biz, a native advertising. So basically ads that are incredibly deceptive, and they don't appear like ads. Um, in fact, there's a kind of a clever native advertising uh, that happened uh, the other day on Tinder, that dating app that neither of us would know anything about. I don't know. Do they use Tinder in Japan? Uh, some people do. Not that I would. Uh, hey not that I would be. Hey uh, aware of that. But you know, you're the one with a uh, steady and lovely girlfriend. So if anyone needs to be careful about talking about Tinder on this podcast, <laughs> I know nothing. I know nothing. Um, is that like a? But they had like a statement or specific <laughs> to Tinder because what well, we need to be clear here. I think general statement probably applies. Uh, <laughs> you know nothing, Alex Samoha. Just, you know no, nothing. Uh, oh, the Wildlings. I'm Jon Snow. Why don't That's you not thing. quite die at the end of this episode? <laughs> okay, I'll maybe, yeah, who knows. Maybe I'll come back next episode alive and well. Um, but yeah, so there's native advertising. Oh, so the, to finish that story, uh, Fallout Shelter had an ad on Tinder as like a profile. Like, hey, you want to... So whatever, it's kind of funny. Uh, but these are really deceptive because these YouTubers have a history of playing games and being like, oh, this is fun, this sucks, this whatever. And people come to these figureheads for their you know purchasing decisions. You know, I think Total Biscuit is probably one of the biggest like uh, you know purchase makers because he plays a bunch of games and people... There's definitely a cult of this guy and I'm not a big fan. Um... But yeah, so he like he'll influence that, and so this is really problematic. When like obviously, if this guy, these YouTubers are saying like, "Oh, this is great, go buy it," and then every time somebody buys it, they get a kickback. That's like that's a subject. It needs to be it needs to be uh, stated. 
And so we've had this for a long time, because I know Battlefield and DICE have had a history of going to these... When I was in my Dark Days of Battlefield um, uh, fandom, I watched a lot of them. But then all of these Battlefield YouTubers would get, you know, sent like new computers and copies, and they'd get early access, and then, of course, all of them, all of them raved about it, um, and but never really disclosed uh, that fact. So I think, honestly, you just we're going to need more disclosure, and it's going to have to be in your face because this is a growing problem and it's very it's illegal it's not only deceptive it's illegal so yeah and with both of these guys where this is happening i'm you know like because they stated it clearly in some videos and not on others i'm more inclined to believe that maybe this is an honest mistake maybe this is something that was just careless and slipped through rather than being like actively malicious i don't want to ascribe that motive to them i think we were joking about it here at the very beginning of this story but i think that we especially on the internet right we're very quick to jump to like accuse people of everything and malicious intent and throw people out and i don't think that that's what needs to happen here but i do think that making sure that youtubers disclose things that they disclose them up front at the beginning of their video even if the ftc needs to kind of give a template maybe for how to disclose yeah. something at the beginning of a youtube video maybe we've hit the point where that is something that needs to be needs to happen I'd support that. Just some sort of image they could pop at the start of the YouTube video or at the end of it or somewhere. Winners don't somewhere. do drugs. The FBI. <laughs> Winners don't do drugs. Oh, man. It takes me back. Yeah, dude. You'd be at, you'd be at, you'd be at a Chuck E. Cheese or uh, just a bowling alley. Winners don't do drugs pops up. Yeah, I'm Pixelated at bowling goodness. alley. Bowling at the pizza place. Uh, okay, okay. There's pizza at the bowling alley. Not, not, why, why you got to assume there's no pizza at the bowling alley? It's not like good pizza, though. I mean... You know I'm Fair right. Enough. You know I'm right. Yeah, I know you're you know right. All right. Moving right. on. Moving on. So that story is important because... Okay. It's important because influential YouTubers making deceptive native advertising is bad for all of us. All right. Well, we're really good. That's clearly no comma. Thank you. <laughs> all right. Uh, my next story is that Nintendo filed a patent for a new console. Uh, so this is very speculative, so we'll keep this fast, but... Uh, GAF users kind of dug through the patents as they always do, which is kind of impressive that people could find all these patents and like find this stuff. And it's probably what uh, patent play- lawyers do in their free time. They're just like, I know, right? Oh, it looks like I'm working when I'm looking for video game patents. <laughs> uh, so yeah, it was revealed some schematics of a po- their possible new console, the NX, or maybe some other console idea they have. Uh, and I think the most uh, kind of discussion worthy thing here is that there's no slot for an optical disc drive, so no CD drive, no disc drive. Uh, and then there's like the slots for memory cards. And so this brings up the question, if this is true, and again, this is highly speculative, this is just a patent. Of course, Nintendo hasn't commented upon it. Are, is this going to be the first all digital console since the PSP go? Or are Nintendo trying to go back to cartridges or what's happening? Uh, yeah. So Fliss thoughts. I think Nintendo will do whatever it wants to do. (laughs) Yeah. I wouldn't be surprised if they were going all digital. Uh, I also wouldn't be surprised if they were going back to cartridges. I could, I can just hear, I can just hear the business meeting at Nintendo talking about all digital or cartridges, right? You know, like kids today love digital, but kids loved cartridges. Hmm, cartridges. Let's make cartridges. That's, I, and then <laughs> Apparently, every- Nintendo's board is ex- is exclusively made up of like Neanderthals. I mean, that was that was like my last samurai, as best I could. Oh God! Oh, have you even seen the last samurai? I have. White savior Tom Cruise. Hey man, don't forget at getting access to the native culture through their women. Of course. Well, I mean, how else? But first, you got to make sure you kill their husband. Uh, women I mean, women I mean, <laughs> love it when you kill their husband. They do. They do. I, I think that's. I think history has shown that over and over again. I mean, what is best in life? <laughs> uh, yeah, You're so going to let that Conan quote drop? You're going to let that drop won't out? You... I'm letting it drop. I'm letting it drop. It's, we got to keep moving. Oh, you're killing um, me. All right, go, go. <laughs> uh, I, I just can't see, of all companies, Nintendo going all digital makes me super skeptical because... I mean, they have that casual stuff. They have the mom, the mom and pop going to the Target or going to the GameStop, and like, oh, let's get, let's get that Danky Kang game. Let's get that Mario game for our kids. You know, it's I think like my to ears see are it bleeding now. <laughs> physically there. I think is important for a lot of people still. 
Um, but I think almost more important for Nintendo, for those casual purchases, that, oh, I'll pick up a game from my kid. And so, for me, it's hard to believe that Nintendo will go all digital. It's crazy to me. It's crazy to me. So I think that if there is no optical drive, and if this is actually for some console of theirs, it's got to be some sort of cartridge-based something or other. It's got to be. Yeah, but you, you can't see them selling digital codes at the store? I guess, but even that, I don't know. I don't know what to make of this. Uh, we'll, we'll wrap this up, and then also the patent... I uh, had a, another controller with a big screen on it. Return of the much maligned YouTube or YouTube Wii U gamepad. I certainly hope not. Oh god! Um, It'll make the console three hundred dollars for no reason. Yeah, I just here's the thing. I sound really down on Nintendo. I still really, really want it to be great. Maybe it'll be great at some point in the future. Whether or not is that's on their own hardware or on other people's hardware, they still make amazing games. So that's, a, that's, that's, I think that's the most important thing. Yeah, man. Well, Hey, all right. So one sentence, why is that important? New Nintendo console is exciting. There it is. There's the sentence. It's like, oh, all right. Well, uh, like that was terrible. <laughs> what was that? <laughs> try again. Try again. Second chance. Here we go. Uh, uh, Nintendo's failure has made design schematics for the new console exciting for the prospect of future gaming. See, now that was good. All right, all right, all right. We want to touch on a couple other things. I want to touch on one thing quickly, very quick. Um, the Witcher, the developers of The Witcher 3, CD Projekt Red, put out an open statement um, this past Tuesday uh, to fans and to people. There was a board meeting, and they announced that The Witcher 3, in its first six weeks of release, sold six million copies. Uh... Not really much to say. I think those are awesome sales figures for an awesome game. Uh, I mean, you've heard me talking here. I'm not going to talk Witcher uh, and Experimental Methods, even though I am still working my way through that game. I played like five hours last night. Don't worry. He'll um, still be working his way through that game four <laughs> weeks from now. Um, but I just it's so awesome to see. I think it just, for me, it just shows gaming is alive and well, that great games and companies that respect fans and understand the industry are rewarded. Um, it's awesome. Yeah, so. yeah, man. I saw a really just a brief part of what they were talking about, and um, they've said that whenever they released free DLC, they noticed a bump in sales for the game. So, hopefully, something that will make other companies uh, take notice and reconsider the way that they milk people with DLC. Though, to be fair, I gotta, I gotta be the the take a step back here, guy. I, I mean, I love that the amount of free DLC they've provided. Witcher Three is an amazing game; they're great developers. But the free DLC they provided are like these tiny little piecemeal, like a new clothing for <clears throat> Gerald, and uh, or one new contract, and one new like they're really small things. And so, I mean, I appreciate it. Like lots of other developers would charge for those, but I don't think they get to be on like you know Mount Sinai, be like. E on to E gamers, look at these tablets. All our DLC will be free. Yes, our horse armor and our one set of cards. Oh, that big expansion that will be paid. But I mean, you, that uh, is impressive. You really need a better Moses voice. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I didn't want to do the old voice. I don't know how old Moses was. <laughs> Either way, I, I mean, it's impressive. I like that they've given free DLC. Other companies would charge for it. It's cool, but I don't think they. Get to be on like the highest of horses. No, I mean, get to be on like I, 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 I want to agree horse. with you, but I also want to point out that like as someone who shamefully shells out like five bucks for new Street Fighter costumes, like a new set of clothes for a character can be a big deal. Yeah, eh, I'm sure it's a big deal to some people too. Uh, so let's there's some esport thing we could talk about very quickly. Yeah, man. Hey, so one of these esports betting platforms put out betting at betting odds that uh, video games will be at the 2030 Winter Olympics. And uh, they gave us uh, three games with odds, uh, Hearthstone, Dota, and Counter-Strike, correct? Yes. And uh, Hearthstone well, is... Counter-Strike Global Offensive. It's just the newest, whatever, newest one. Yeah, the newest Counter-Strike. Why don't you go take some Ritalin? Um... <laughs> <laughs> Jeez, these daggers. <laughs> that escalated quickly. All right, uh... Hearthstone has 99 to 1 odds, Dota 79 to 1, and Counter Strike 49 to 1. How do you feel about that? How do you feel about games being at the Olympics? I mean, come on. You have curling at the Olympics. Whoa, <laughs> I know Olympics. you are not hating on curling. I know I love curling. Not what's I watch I watch curling, but it's usually a bunch of fat Canadians sliding around on ice on their knees with a freaking kitchen broom. You don't watch women's curling, do you? 
I watch women's curling too. It's a bunch of women on their hands and knees sweeping in front of a broom. Or sweeping with a broom in front of a freaking boulder. You are I mean it's a stupid You are killing me here, man. Like you did you did you not see the Ukrainian team? I mean but you are not trying to act like you're some mega fan of curling. No, no, no. I'm just saying that I like watching it, and I like watching it both for the sporting and for the athletes. <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, but uh, there's a lot of stupid sports at both the Summer and Winter Olympics, and viewership uh, is pretty big for a lot of different esports. And so I honestly don't think it would, it's ridiculous to think that video games will come to the Olympics at some point. Uh Though, you know, it just, it seems hard, like, to organize it. But I, I'm cool that people are betting on it. And honestly, 49 to 1 are not bad odds for Counter-Strike Global Offensive. Like, that's, that's like, on the scale of things being likely. That's, they're putting it at, that's, I think the betters there are putting it as pretty likely. I mean, that's, a 50 to 1 payout is not, like, as crazy, you know? Yeah, man, hey, I, uh, I'm tempted to put 5 bucks down on one of those games with, with odds like that. <laughs> yeah, right. Why not? Uh, though to me, to me, it seems kind of crazy that uh, Counter Strike would be above Dota because I think Dota is such like we talked about it is such the international game, and so I would think that would probably be the most likely of all the games. But who knows? Maybe that's just less likely because it has competition with League of Legends, whereas Counter Strike is you know has no competition in its slot. Yeah, man. No, very cool. So nice, lo- nice little minor stories. Anything else you want to grab before we move along? We got a lot to talk about today. Yeah, I know, I know. Uh, yeah, there's just one really cool thing. Um, this, this, these, these uh, people put together this chat roulette. You know, chat roulette. You know, those back in the days where seventy percent of people you see their penis, and the other seventy percent are like someone doing some YouTube video. Well, this is that other. That's that other thirty percent here doing YouTube video. Uh, they made this first person shooter like interactive thing where the person was wearing a a, a camera, and then the, the people on the other side got to choose their. Yeah, you know, kind of choose their own adventure where they were, where they were going, and fighting zombies and stuff. And it was really cool. It's a really cool idea to kind of like control first person shooter with chat roulette. There was is honestly pretty good execution. It had a lot of actors and a lot of cool stuff set up. And it's funny to see how people instinctually kind of like know this like the gamification of these scenarios. Like, oh, look over there. Like, oh, like there was one scene where. Uh, the, the character entered a church, and they're like, oh, check in that vase. There might be something there. And then there was, like, health in there that they put. So it was like, kind of funny that people are instinctually kind of know where to look for that thing. It's kind of how ingrained gaming is in uh, culture. And it's honestly as fun as lighthearted is cool. I don't know who's still on chat roulette <laughs> other than penises looking to be seen. Um, but Yeah, man, I, I, I think, I think the cool. real question here is how many dogs do you have to wade through before you get to see your first-person shooter? <laughs> I, I mean... Probably never. Probably you're just going to be in a sea of dicks until <laughs> or, or, you're never going to get out. Or is your dog your first person shooter? <laughs> yeah, right. Oh, oh wow, that's man. probably the dirtiest joke we've ever made on this podcast. <laughs> uh, but yeah, that's cool. They did a good job, and it, it it's cool. So watch the video; you can look it up. Um, it's it's fun to it's fun to see, and it's I love the kind of lighthearted, you know, things that have a good intention behind them that make people happy, and it's cool to see that stuff. Yeah, definitely, really cool. So those are the stories we chose. We cut out probably another half that we don't have time for. But we'd love to hear from the community, the news items, you all thought that had the, had the biggest impact. Whether you thought Cliff Bazinski's new game was worthy of a mention. Or whether or not the Pokemon Championship Under Assault should have been mentioned. Who knows? Uh, so please feel free to shoot us an email. That's at impactfactorpodcast at gmail.com. Again, impactfactorpodcast at gmail.com. We'd love you forever if you sent us an email. But now it's time to put things in perspective. Perspectives. Perspectives is part of the show, well, when any number of things can happen. In academia, it's when investigators share their opinions with the community at large. Here, it's a revolving section with significantly more revolution now, where we experiment with what's worth discussing. So let's get it started. I know before you guys, we just to kind of take a step back, a little inside baseball here, Fliss and I really wanted to keep this show energetic and engaging and keeping you guessing, and I think the perspectives is what makes the impact factor the impact factor. What makes us sneak? I think it's our signature, and we hope you guys agree. And so we've chosen a bu- I've kind of, Fliss and I have theory crafted a bunch of new kind of perspectives to go into, so hope you guys are excited for this ride. We're excited too. we got a brand new type of pers- perspectives today, and that's thesis defense. That's right, yeah. You've probably noticed that we've trimmed down our news and views a little bit. Let us know what you think about that. Let us know of what you think or let us know what you think of 
thesis defense. So this week, we're introducing one of our new perspective sections. Uh, we're calling it thesis defense. Alex is going to lose his thesis defense. Uh, but in academia, every new insight is earned. It's defended against the critique and questions of your peers, your mentors, and your community. On the impact factor, thesis defense is a section where Alex or I will propose a hypothesis about anything games related. We're going to talk about the evidence that led us to our conclusion, and then we're going to defend our viewpoint. Today, Alex gets us started and will be the first defeated in thesis defense. So Alex, kick <laughs> us off. Two enter, one leaves. The guy who lives in San Francisco will win. All right, so my, my thesis for today's episode is that 2015 is the year that next-gen, current-gen consoles, the PS4 and the Xbox One, became a must-buy. So initially, Fliss, what's your reaction? What's your reaction to the statement? A bold claim. Bold like Doritos. Do you, uh, and so just from a visceral gut reaction, do you agree, disagree? Where do you feel like you fall on the spectrum? As someone, let's 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 point of full disclosure here. As someone who just recently purchased a PS4, well, I'm glad I'm glad you mentioned that. Yes, this is the year that I succumbed, that I bought a PS4. But I don't actually think that the PS4 is a must buy, and I'll, I'll tell you why later. But first, tell me why you think it's a must buy. Okay, so the PS4 and the Xbox One. I'll refer to PS4. It means both, but since I'm a PS4 gamer, I'm just going to use that for simplicity's sake. Um, I think the PS4 became a must-buy for a number of reasons. They had a slower, run, a slower launch library uh, and a slower launch than, I think, previous consoles before, and people were on the fence. However, these consoles have been selling like gangbusters, and that's because people are excited for the promise of the future. And we've had a lot on the horizon for a long time, and a lot shaping up, but this is, 2015 is a year where games that had been promised from the beginning really started coming out, and really started moving past this infancy and embryonic stage where, where developers are experimenting with what they can do on the PS4. And I think we have a quartet of games this year that are all going to be remembered at the end of the PS4 life cycle as some of the best games on the console. And I know that's a bold claim, but I really think it's true. So the quartet of games are The Witcher 3, Batman Arkham Knight, Metal Gear Solid 5, and Fallout 4. Um, so one of the issues that this current console generation had is there's no compelling purchases. You could buy the same game on your previous gen consoles, your PS3s, your Xbox 360s, and still be fine. But I think these games are really at home on the new console and are exceptional games. The Witcher 3, as I've talked about in great extent, is one of the best open world games I've played, certainly one of the best RPGs I've played, and easily one of the best games this year that I played. It's, you know, it's dynamic, it's interesting, the world is packed full of content, but all of that content is expertly and, you know, perfectly tailored. The Witcher 3 got 10s across the board, 9s, one of the best reviewed games of the year, one of the best reviewed games of the generation. Batman Arkham Knight, similarly, is exceptional. Um, has, you know, not only from a storytelling perspective, but again, has a nice big open world, and the graphics are something that could not be accomplished on previous gen console. Metal Gear Solid 5, again, is a game I haven't played. It comes out <clears> this <throat> next week. <laughs> a Hideo Kojima game. A Hideo Kojima game. Yeah, there we go. We gotta... Yeah, less, less, less people forget. Uh, but that game is getting insane reviews. Uh, tens everywhere, saying how the content is so deep and so rich and so rewarding. And again, creating a world that is open and designed with such scrutiny but still so expansive that it couldn't really have existed on our previous console. And then we have Fallout 4, which, again, this is speculation here, but this game is going to be massive. And it's one of those games that got... Fallout 3 is one of those games that got people to buy previous consoles. I think Fallout 4 will be the one. And so if you were just to have a PS3 or 360 at this point, none of these games, you know, really came in any substantial way to those consoles. And these are must-play experiences for people who care about these big production triple a game so this is just half the story but Fliss, what do you think about that this is where these big triple a's that understand what they're doing they understand the architecture they understand the infrastructure they understand what gamers want what they can do with the power of the machine are coming out there's four of them this year that are all huge all right man well i cannot argue with your assessment of those games they all look great i haven't played any of them um i'm excited to get into witcher 3 eventually i will definitely make my way to batman i don't know if i'll end up playing metal gear solid 5 for a long time um, and I have reasonably little interest in Fallout 4, although that might make change. Um, but this is this is where my first kind of reaction against what you're saying is, because 
Uh, I, I want to take you up on two points here um, that right. I think prevent these games from being like the absolute jump to must buy. Um, first of all, basically all the games you're talking about are open world experiences that take a billion years to complete. And so, yeah, you know what? You could probably buy those four games, and if you have relatively little time to game, that could see you through the year. Um, and that's, Easily. And that's, Easily. <laughs> and that's really cool, but if that's not the kind of game you want, if you are not after big AAA immersive experience, um, which I realize a lot of gamers are, but if that isn't your game style, if the open world isn't your game style, like I personally find open world games to be very stressful. Um, if that's not your game style, the basically those games you talked about won't appeal to you at all. And continuing on that, um, all of those games are sequels. And The Witcher 3 gotta be fair it is it is kind of its own thing it's kind of only a three as being the functuate like being a a, a, as a function of being a continuing story but it really does hold its own it really does tell its own story but batman you yourself have said that it is not the right batman to start with you are on record on this podcast saying that that's the wrong batman to start with metal gear solid five Dude, if you're not playing Middle Gear Solid for the story, you're playing it for the wrong reasons. And you have, like, 18 games to play before you get to play Metal Gear Solid 5. Fallout 4 is kind of, again, it's closer to Witcher 3. It is the continuation of a series, but I don't think you will need to understand the previous games to play it. I think it looks really cool and it's got a great aesthetic. But again, it is just another Fallout game. So, my two points here, just to summarize, wrap it up. Sew it up into bite-sized pieces that a biomedical scientist can understand. The games are all open world, and if that's not your thing, that doesn't make the console more attractive. They're all sequels, and at least half of the games you, you mentioned require previous games to make them enjoyable. All right, let me go point by point here, then. The first point, open world games. I agree there is a certain intimidation factor for open world games, but I think one of the things that's going to be important in your current uh, gaming environment and something that is getting better is open world games in the old days used to mean unfocused, unguided content. There's just a lot of it there, and you could do whatever you wanted, and that none of the content was particularly strong. I think the game that started to change that was Red Dead Redemption, but really has started to come into their own here. I think playing just through the single player plot, the single the main story plot of The Witcher 3, is as good as, if not better, than focused linear RPGs from back in the day. The thing is, in addition to that, you're given these fully fleshed out side quests, this big world to explore, if that's something you want to do. And I think, for you, Fliss, it's going to be more about putting yourself in the mindset that... I know there's a million flowers over there I can pick. I see that dragon flying in the distance. I'm going to ignore that, and I'm going to make a beeline on the story quest, which is clearly clearly market, you know, clearly demarcated and clear you know, what you need to do to progress with the story. And you can have that same you know, 20, 30-hour RPG linear experience just playing through the main story. And I think Batman has that. I think Witcher 3 has that. And I, again, I can't comment on Metal Gear Solid 5 or Fallout 4, but certainly... I think we've gotten to a very cool point in open world games um, and games in general where they give you a lot of stuff extra to do, uh, but the main the main meat, the main story campaign is interesting. And so I think gamers who, like you, are opposed to open worlds, I think that's just a pill you're going to have to swallow. Because, again, people are getting pickier and pickier with purchase decisions, and so I think the more content you pack into the game, the more likely your game is going to sell. And so I think it's going to be on you, Fliss, to be able to focus in on just keeping yourself restricted to the main story. Um, and so to, to that point, I, w- I would disagree. I think the content isn't unfocused. I think it's just you have so many different focal points. You can choose which one you want to focus in on. Uh, and then in terms of the sequel thing, I can see your point, and at that point certainly applies to Batman. Uh, but on the Witcher 3 front, again, I never played a Witcher game. I haven't read any of the books. But the second I was in, I was within the, you know, a reasonable amount of time. I was in the lore. I understood what was going on. The plot of the game is very simple, and I was engaged. And Fallout 4 is going to be like that. Fallout 4 is like Mad Max is just a character's exploration of the wasteland, and that is you know going to be completely independent of another game. And Metal Gear Solid 5 is kind of a prequel to a lot of the story, so you don't need to know as much. But yeah, I mean, I, honestly, the people who understand Metal Gear Solid 5 are like some soothsayers. Like I don't. There's so much nonsense going on there. So. But I think that 
a sequel is to be expected because, again, you need to make your game sell. You need to have something that grips someone, and these IPs that people recognize is, is the way to do that. And so, I mean, I think on those points, you can focus in, again, summarizing, I think you can focus in on the main story, and those main stories are as good as, if not better, than traditional linear stories that you're more accustomed to. And I think many of these games take steps to be their own thing that don't require you to have played the previous titles. And I think in the naming, you can see that too. I mean, The Witcher 3, it's just, I mean, it's very hard to tell even looking at the box art. I have it right here in front of me that it is the third Witcher game. It says The Witcher Wild Hunt, and there's like a little claw mark that has, you know, three claws, so it's the three. But honestly, it could be The Witcher Wild Hunt and, you know, a new game. And you've seen that with Infamous Second Son and all these new, all these old IPs coming to next gen. It's kind of these reboots. Yeah, but and so I think that's. I, I want to be clear here that, like, I, I don't have a problem with Witcher 3. I don't have a problem with Fallout 4. And I, I hope hopefully made that clear that I think both of those games do stand on their own. For The Witcher, to me, since I, I also haven't played it on PC or anything because this is its first foray into PlayStation, to me it's effectively a new IP. Um, and I'm mm-hmm. willing to treat The Witcher as such. We could even call The Witcher 3 uh, as, a, as a new IP for the function of our discussion. And I'd be fine with that. But I think that the the problem that I have with saying that it's a must buy this year, the problem I have with your argument is ju- just on that basic level, is that half the games you're talking about require previous games. You have to have played the other two Batman games to get the most out of Batman. You have to have played at least some Metal Gear Solid games to get the most out of Metal Gear Solid. I also like just from my own reaction, like sure. I think that it, it, you make a very compelling argument that I should focus on the linear story, that I should create the gameplay experience I want, and that they're giving me the tools to create the gameplay experience I want, and that's great. But I also don't like being told, like, hey, open world is the way games are going, and if you don't like it, go wait in a sea of dongs. Like, I don't like that. And so <laughs> The same sea we mentioned earlier, <laughs> the chat roulette sea. Exactly. There, there's only one sea of dogs, Alex. <laughs> so, thank the lord oh man but I, I don't like that i think that i think that saying these are the games that's how games are gonna be like i don't i don't personally accept that i'm gonna keep supporting games that provide good linear experiences and i'm not saying i won't wade into these open world experiences i'm just saying that they are not enough on their own well, to motivate me to buy a console it's funny you should say that because uh, especially on the PlayStation 4 side, but then also on the Xbox side, to supplement these AAA releases, which you only get a couple big ones per year, there's been so much indie love coming that those linear experiences that you want, you can find in these indie games. And sure, these are indie games that have potentially been out for a while on the PC, but they're coming and really filling in all the gaps in um, the libraries of these current consoles to the point that if you have any interest in these like exceptional indies at all, and, you know, don't have the means to play a computer or don't want to play a computer or certainly want them to support these AAA games that I think are great and at home at a console, you have that. Just this past Tuesday, 14 games came out on PS4. 14. And that only one of those was a AAA with uh, uh, Until Dawn, all two, Until Dawn, if you count that's a AAA, and Madden. And the rest were indies. And we're getting so many of these quality, fun, great indies. Galaxy is great. Titan Souls has been great. Uh, Axiom Verge got tons of great reviews, and these are linear, focused experiences that can provide that same gap. So you're getting these must-play indies, and on PS4 especially, a lot of them you're getting first before you can get them anywhere else. And so I think you've got this super strong AAA content, and you've got this constant, almost overwhelming influx of focused, linear uh, indie games that are exceptional, and I think that package is so compelling that again, this is just this is not talking to someone who has a PC or whatever. This is not talking. This is someone who wants, who had a previous gen console or wants to have a gaming console. Period. I think it's so compelling of a time to jump in because you everything you could want you have. And what was missing? The indie games have been here for a while, but what was missing were these compelling, huge, expansive, worth your you know quotation fingers here worth your sixty dollar AAA games, and that we got those this year. I think everything else is gravy. Yeah, but and the th- I mean, yeah, I I completely disagree because you could play most of those good indies on your Vita. You could you could sit down and do that. You just reviewed Titan Souls on Vita, on the ImpactFactor.blogspot.com. See, even yeah, but I'm a good but I have a, I mean, but I have I mean, I'm one of the ten people in the country who has a Vita. You know, um, <laughs> the the thing is, if most people aren't 
multiple multiple console gamers. They'll have their one dedicated console and then their smartphone. Uh, in addition to that, I think a lot of people and still so, have handholds. I mean, sure, sure, most of them have 3ds. Um, yeah, but, but then, but then, so many of these games don't come to 3ds. I mean, these games right. are PC, PS4, and Vita, and Xbox One. But if you're if you're dedicated Sony, then you pretty much have a Vita right now. And I think that a lot of the good games, I I don't think that's true. I mean, a lot of people do. dedicated Sony. You've got a huge cut sale numbers for the PS4, and the Vita has been out for years now, and it only has sold like 10 million units. Or nine million, or eight million, something, something abysmal. You no, know, I mean the Vita is basically just a handheld PS3, so I guess that makes sense. And the Vita also didn't have a great library when it first launched. But looking at you, Sony, I disagree with that. But that's not the point of this. Look, this is not the point of this thesis defense. Looking at you, Sony. Um, no, man. But I just I don't see anything happening this year specifically that makes that makes me want to like grab all my friends and say buy a PS4. For me, for me, the games that come out that, that make me want to buy the console are coming out next year. And that's fair. I mean, 2016 is certainly, if you if my if my uh, thesis is a little weak here, I think by 2016, that, that you know, is true. So if I wanted a weaker thesis, I could say by 2016. But I really think that 2015, there's a game for everyone and a game, an exceptional game for every kind of gamer that's coming out this year, whether in the indie space, whether in the AAA space. Whether, you know, wherever you have it, wherever you want it, there's a lot of surprises. And I think that increase is this fall, PS3 and Xbox 360 gamers are going to be hurting. Because a lot of the franchises and a lot of the games they like aren't coming to PS3. Or they're coming as handicapped, gimped, you know, messed up, featureless, or, you know, feature light versions of the same games that came out on PS4. The Call of Duty that's going to launch on PS3 this year is going to be nothing like the Call of Duty that launches on PS4 this year. Yeah, and that's fair, but if unless you are like totally up to date on your games library on your PS3 and if you are then I applaud you. Um but unless you are, you still have lots of good games. You still can play the indies for the most part. Um yes, there are PS4 exclusive indies and they are great. I acknowledge that. But... A lot a lot of them are coming now just PS4 and Vita. Yeah. A lot, I've noticed that there's a trend that PS3 isn't getting as many. Yeah, but you still have enough I think to keep you going and I think that maybe 2015, I'm willing to see that maybe 2015 could become the year that these consoles are like absolutely worth, worth your dough. If Fallout 4 delivers on its promises, if, if Star Wars Battlefront and Call of Duty deliver satisfying first-person shooter experiences, um, then maybe, maybe as we get closer to Christmas, we'll say that, but... As of right now, even as someone who did just jump on the PS4 ship, I don't think that it's like the thing where you need to go buy this. Now is the time. Fair, fair enough. And, so, and lest I, lest, before we wrap up here, lest I sound like I'm just making groundless opinions here, I want to be clear that my reasons for that are you can access a lot of games still through the old consoles. There's a huge library of backup content uh, backed up content on the old consoles that is becoming very, very cheap very, very quickly um, through the PSN sales and uh, Xbox Live. And finally, that the games, that there's a barrier to entry of all the games that you've cited as being must-buy that I find to be unsatisfying. Fair enough. So I don't think you can, I don't think you can cite the backlog thing as an example, there are still so many PS2 games I never got around to playing. Does that mean new, I should have never moved to PS3? I don't know, man. It depends on which PS2 games you weren't getting at. No, oh, no, God. no. I mean, <laughs> you, you can choose You choose when to make that jump. I just don't think that the games that have come out right now justify saying, no, you should abandon what you're doing and move to these games. Not abandon, but I think it's important in 2015 moving forward that you have a PS4 or an Xbox One. If you're you know, a console gamer. Again, I'm not talking about PCs. Blocks of this. We're not talking about PCs. Obviously, if you have a PC, you're good to go. <laughs> All right. Well, you've heard, you've heard my opinions. You've heard Alex's. Let us know. Let us know what you think. Send us an email. Who's right? Who's right? Yeah. Tell tell Alex how wrong he is. Send us an email. Uh, tweet at us. Let us know what you thought. We'll uh, we'll talk about this again, and we will have more thesis defenses in the future, as well as many other surprises. Ooh, ooh, ooh. So please be excited. Please stay tuned. Yeah. Uh, but let's wrap this. Let's wrap this up. Oh uh, yeah. So please let us send us an email impactfactorpodcast at gmail dot com to let me know that I won uh, and I successfully defended my thesis. 
and that Fliss is a poo poo head. Um, please, but we... please also <laughs> be sure to tweet, tweet at me. That's at the C Fliss on Twitter. Tweet at me. Tell me what a good job I did proving Alex wrong. Tell me to remind Alex that he is swimming in a sea of dongs, <laughs> and uh, and let us know what you thought. <laughs> yeah, uh, but our perspectives from last week. We went through a crowdfunding um, plat- new crowdfunding platform called Fig. Um, so please listen to our last episode. Uh, if you can, it'll be up on our YouTube page. If you can't find it anywhere else at that point, and little did episode- we know, yeah, little did we know the talent residing in our listeners. Yeah, very talented. So let's run this. Let's run this through. Um, let's run this through, Fliss. We got a great feedback from listener Bullet Babe. Yeah, she's been she's written into the show before, and she provided us with. Some really cool information. She gave us a spreadsheet breaking down the Bloodstained Kickstarter percentage-wise and showing us exactly how much money came from which level of backer, where the majority of money was drawn, and the kind of the point of this was to kind of break down whether or not Bloodstained would have been more successful had it used Fig. So, Alex, what are what are what were the barriers on Fig? So the, again, the barrier on Fig is you have to be an incredible, you have to be an accredited investor. Uh, so you have to get your licensing, and then you have to donate a thou- You have to invest a thousand dollars or more as a minimum. Right. So looking for Fig, we're looking for that thousand dollar minimum because it's kind of hard to track accredited investors since um, Kickstarter does not display that information. All right. So looking at the information that Bullet Babe gave us, we can find that the majority of backers percentage wise and the majority of money percentage wise actually came at the $60 level. So people were pl- were paying for bloodstained with their $60 if you will donating, we should say because we were very clear about that. Donating $60 but effectively at the same level that you would buying a AAA game. Um, after that the next highest level percentage wise for backers came at $28, but the next highest percentage of money raised was at $100. As we get a little bit higher, we can show that Roughly 4.2% of backers provided an impressive 14.8% of funding at the $300 level. But as we've covered, right, we're looking at like $300, $100, $28, and $60 levels here. So all of that is well below the $1,000 minimum. If we turn our our heads, turn our attention to that $1,000 minimum, we find that only about 4% of the total funding came from that and we can look deeper and see that 90 percent of the funding and 99 percent of the backers were all under 500 dollars. so a lot of evidence to kind of support your uh your arguments from last week alex that uh <laughs> that two weeks in a row that i'm making uh, making the winning point uh i'm pretty sure you lost this week so <laughs> also also, I want to point out something here. Got to got to build you up before I break you down. Um, I think I'm doing that wrong. Uh, the uh, we were if we look at their goals though, if we look at the number of spots they opened up for like really really high level backing, they had very very good completion. They were doing four out of five, five out of five, two out of two, one out of one. For their their goals, their their donations of like five thousand dollars, ten thousand dollars, these really really high money donation levels, they were filling them out. So, could there be a certain amount of bias here from the platform? I, I think that that's something we have to consider here, as they they were had very good luck meeting the high level funding goals. For sure, for sure. And I mean. Uh, Bullet Babe did an excellent job. She, you know, really went through and kind of categorized all, this, categorized all this information and made it very clear. I think, again, it's it's hard of, to draw any uh, concrete conclusions from this uh, because of the differences in the platforms. Um, but I do get the impression here that still more money comes from the Kickstarter option. Uh, but it'll be interesting. It's it's interesting that you know that that the, the most striking figure to me that she, she pulled out was that about fifteen percent of funding. Um, you know, only four point four percent of backers provided fifteen percent of the funding, and that's huge. And so, I think if you get enough of those kind of the kind of crowd, and then certainly you're going to have more of that crowd that's going to be on Fig because they're the accredited investors and they you know could potentially make a profit. 
or hopefully for them, I guess, make a profit. Uh, you know, I do see that you could attain financial success on Fig, and that is what the statistical breakdown also kind of rung true for me. So it's an awesome breakdown. Thank you so much for sending in feedback. Thank you for listening as well. Uh, it's awesome. Yeah, we really appreciate it. It was it was really cool to see, really get to get get our hands dirty with some numbers. So definitely, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Yeah. So it. shout outs to Bullet Babe. Thanks for listening. Um, but now that our work is done and logged, let's get into our experimental methods. Experimental methods. In experimental methods, Fliss and I talk about the video games we've been playing recently. No papers or pipettes, cells or senses here, just our words. We look about works, what doesn't, what we're looking forward to testing. So Fliss, now that you're finally on vacation, what experiments have you been running? Well, first I have the shameful duty to report the failure of my Demon Souls bed experiment. Aha! It has been eight weeks, folks. That's right. It, that my time limit is up, and having spent basically four weeks not playing video games, I was unable to complete Demon Souls. So Alex will be choosing probably a San Jose Sharks. God help me. Fitted cap to uh, to to have at my expense. I'll honor the bet, and I'll have to try and redeem myself on Dark Souls or Bloodborne. In the future. Oh, it feels so, so sweet. Mm, a little bit of that nectar of the gods, victory, salty tears of my co-host, losing the bet in spectacular fashion. It was it was a pretty sound defeat. Uh, <laughs> he my, uh, beat what, you beat what? Ended up beating what? Two of the games, like 20 bosses? My, uh, my overconfidence was my weakness. I told you to go. Dodging and magic. What'd you do? You went no, no, no you magic said, and all said, blocking. Go magic. And I said, no, I'm not going to go magic. And I went for my standard character, which, as you have pointed out, is incapable of dodging. So I learned a lot. I learned a lot. I will go back and finish the game eventually once I stop playing Blizzard games. Um, I'm going to go back. I'm going to finish it. I feel like I have some pride riding on finishing the game, no matter how long it takes at this point. Uh, but like I said, uh, the Souls game, it's fun. I'm looking forward to getting into a later game, and perhaps we can have another wager at that time. <laughs> Bloodborne bet. Please stay tuned. Please be excited. Please be excited for future Souls <laughs> bets. Uh, please look on Alex's Twitter, where I'm sure he will post a number of pictures of him styling his new cap. Please don't judge the cap for the ugliness of the person wearing it. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> All right, get into something that you actually did play since you decided to lose the bet. Well, I will not confirm or deny that I decided to lose that, but having realized that it was unwinnable uh, for me at the point this week, coming back from vacation, I settled in for some Heroes of the Storm. And I know I know people probably are tired of hearing about Heroes of the Storm, but there's been some cool content added. They've added another new map. There's another new character. It's very cool. Lots of exciting stuff for me. Um, Blizzard also just sent out a, uh, a present of 2,000 gold this past week to everybody who was there for the first week when it opened. Wait, really? Yeah, you didn't get that email? No, I haven't checked. I haven't been on. Crap, I want 2,000 gold. So, uh, yeah, we went out on the 21st. So, I don't know, Alex. Maybe uh, maybe they just knew that uh, you were too busy swimming in a sea of dongs to, uh, to appreciate their God, gold. Ah, dang it. I'm checking my email now. All right, keep talking. Yeah, actually, he is, folks. He's just completely lost interest in the rest of the world to go find his virtual gold. Keep, keep, keep talking. This, keep this talking. miser. Go, go, go. Keep, All right. Go, go, go. All right, so I bought I bought my 10 heroes. I'm ready for Hero League. I'm ready to do that. He's not listening at all. He's too busy looking for his gold. I don't see. Keep going. Keep going. All right, so anyway, I'm going to tell you a story that you, at, you folks at home listening will appreciate. Alex won't because he's searching his email for gold. Um... Maybe there's an email from... I want to know where the gold at. I want the gold. Give me the gold. <laughs> hey, man, maybe there's an email from a Nigerian prince who can help you out. <laughs> <laughs> this amateur sketch of a leprechaun. Uh, I wear this this leprechaun armor. It was passed down for generations <laughs> of my family. I had no idea that you no, had... No. Uh, leprechaun from Mobile, Alabama. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nothing? I know what you're talking about. I just... I was picturing you with the leprechaun Could be armor a crackhead who got a hold of the wrong <laughs> stuff. <laughs> you're killing me here, man. All right. Uh, <laughs> but hey, so... Going to do something new. I want to tell you a story of victory, a story of me drinking that nectar of God, the gods, a story of me getting to drink the salty tears of my opponents in the best possible fashion. So one of the things that I really like about Heroes of the Storm, one of the things that I think differentiates it from uh, the other MOBAs out there is the potential for comebacks. I think Heroes of the Storm 
really gives you like a little better bit of a better chance to be able to sway the game back in your favor. And so I had a game going earlier. Uh, I was playing Rainer, uh, a ranged character who specializes at clearing lanes and opening it up. So, you know, obviously in Heroes, like a lot of other MOBAs, you each have a base and each team is of five is trying to destroy their opponent's base by first destroying a series of outer walls and towers and then making it in there to destroy, you know, the ancient or the core or whatever you want to call it. Um, so I was playing Rainer. Uh, I was clearing the lanes. We were on Dragonshire. So Dragonshire is this map where you've got two shrines, one at the top and one at the bottom of the map. And then in the middle of the map, there's this giant dragon statue. And when the shrines activate, you can kind of like stand on them to take control of it. And then if you get control of both shrines, you can take control of the giant dragon statue. And one of your characters on your team becomes this giant dragon character who specializes in smashing buildings, right? So it's a great way to make your way down to destroy your enemy's base, to destroy their core. And uh, we got behind really early. They came with a very, very aggressive push. We had a very soft and squishy team. Uh, Lots of characters that died quickly. Um, I myself died a couple of times in early lane battles. Um, It's hard to co-lane with KT, with Raynor. Um, also, I want to give props to the, uh, the guy playing Muradin. Um, we, we were playing versus a, uh, a Muradin and a Sylvanas in the lane. So they didn't exactly have a lot of damage output, but they, uh, they made use of their stun, uh, the Muradin stun really, really effectively. So props to them. They got me, they got KT. Um, we were behind early. They, they'd smashed in one of our towers. They were marching towards our core. Um, they'd gotten two Dragon Knights in a row and we hadn't been able to do basically anything and then the shrines activated again and we were like okay we're gonna do this we split up into two teams three to the top two to the bottom took the shrines really fast i raced down to the bottom got the dragon and then their other team walloped me like just my team our coordination completely broke down some people were going merc camps some people were like just Running in circles. I don't know what they were doing. They were not supporting me. So I smashed the gate and did damage to the tower. And that was it. And I was just like, at that point, we were behind two levels. And I was just, this is it. I can see now that we're not going to win this game. Where we're, nothing's going to happen. And then, all of a sudden, our team like magically came together in the unspoken coordination of the internet. You wrote about this on the Impact Factor, Unspoken Communication in game Games. We were not using the pings system. We were not using the chat. We just suddenly came together as the other team overextended way deep into our zone. We were able to catch them, and we just pincer moved them, wiped them out. The shrines came up. They were down. We grabbed the Dragon Knight. I zipped in there, grabbed it just before the other team respawned. And we just marched down the middle, barreled down to their core, team wiped them again, and it was game. We went from way behind to game in like three minutes. It was ridiculous. Nice, man. Nice. And, you know, not to toot my own horn too much, because certainly without my teammates coming together, without getting our, our act together as a team, there's there's nothing that I could have done, but... I was very proud of, like, being there to snipe the Dragon Knight both times just before the enemy was able to retake shrines or respawn. And then also I think that, like, pretty decent Dragon Knight play on that march down the middle of being able to choose when to knock people out of the fight <laughs> yeah, just, uh, was, was yeah, nice, man. Nice. certainly a contributing factor. So, Rainer the laner. Rainer the laner getting his win. So that's my tale of victory for today nice, from, from Heroes of the Storm. Hopefully... Hopefully told in an exciting narrative fashion. Narrative fashion. Yeah, it's good, man. It's good. I am, uh, I'm excited to play Heroes of the Storm. I, haven't, I used to play solo queue by myself, but I've kind of, since I have so much else to play, I've just kind of gone away from that. But if I can if I can play with you, man, <laughs> jump back in. Man. Um, I'm sure you played some Hearthstone, too, but maybe we'll save that for next week because I'm sure we'll still be playing around with new decks and the new Grand Tournament definitely, cards. Definitely, definitely. Uh, so I'll keep mine short. I'll cut one of these. I'll talk about it next week. Uh, but one of the things that I played this week, or uh, this past week, and was the Call of Duty Black Ops 3 beta. 
Um, so this was on the PS4 last weekend. At first, it was um, just a pre-order exclusive, and so I was like, yeah, whatever. But I, I've been kind of seeing Black Ops 3, and it looks kind of fun. And then on Friday, the fast Friday, they opened it up, public beta, and it ran Friday through Monday. And I played a lot on Friday and Saturday and Sunday. Um, so I, I think Call of Duty, even for myself, but unfairly gets a little bit of slack for not changing up enough between year to year. Uh, and playing Black Ops 3, there's a lot that they're trying to do to differentiate themselves from previous Call of Duty titles. Uh, first and foremost, the game is now incredibly fast. Like, even even faster than previous Call of Duties. The time to fast. kill is... Gotta go fast. Yeah, gotta, gotta be fast. The time to kill is crazy. Like, if you don't get... If you don't catch someone by surprise, if, if the second... The, the person who gets you down, you know, aiming down the sights faster is probably going to win the firefight. Uh, but there's, they've changed up a lot of things, and I think on a fundamental level, they introduced this new system called the Specialist System that takes a lot of inspiration from fighting games and from these MOBAs like Dota or Heroes of the Storm. Uh, because you have... You choose a character to play in multiplayer, and each of that character has two special abilities that... Um, that you can choose from. Uh, so one of the characters I played as, I forget their name, but the special ability was this vision pulse. And so, you know, you you accumulate points by killing enemies and by do- accomplishing objectives, as well as by dying. You, your, your bar filled gradually. Uh, and by pressing L1 and R1, you can activate your special ability. And this vision pulse you know, kind of turned the screen gray and shot up the, uh, this pulse, uh, which highlighted all enemies and made them glow, uh, uh, you know, red, and I could see them moving, like, through walls and stuff. And other characters, they, they pulled out this giant kind of grenade launcher that was a one-hit kill uh, if it was a direct shot or shot a bunch of these smaller grenades. And another character had this, like, electricity... Like, yeah, this, electri- this shot electricity from this right rail gun that would kill anyone who was hit with it and then would leave an electrical field on the ground that if anyone stepped into it. So there's a bunch of different abilities, and these kind of felt like supers or superpowers. Um, and so I could already imagine a world in which team composition is very important and how these special abilities cooperate with each other. So if you have a 5v5 in Call of Duty, it's going to be very important that one person plays the Vision character and another person plays like this crowd control character. And so again, it's kind of creating this role, aside from the, you know, the gun-specific and perk-specific customization... Uh, from Call of Duty, also has this extra layer of this kind of, like, hero-like brawler, this hero-like game where each, this, this kind of, on this higher level, that choice is important. And I thought that system was really cool and really engaging, especially because the character designs in Black Ops 3, because it's kind of this kind of more further future now, like, I played as, like, uh, as, a, as playing as this girl who had this cybernetic arm, she was the one with the grenade launcher, and she was, like, badass, she had, like, a shaved mohawk and stuff. Why am I not at uh, all surprised that you decided to go with the noob tube? <laughs> uh, so I, li- I like the character design, and I like that they there was a diversity too there. I thought that was cool. There's a black guy. There's several females. There's an Asian female. Oh, that's great. There's a robot. That's great. Um, robots need but, representation too. Yeah, <laughs> robots need representation too. I mean, he's awesome. I didn't get to unlock him. No, but seriously, um, that's awesome. That's that's really cool and good to hear. It's it's cool. It's good to hear. Um, but one of the things that kind of still stood out to me is it's very much Call of Duty still, which is impressive because they've uh, managed to accomplish being a new, a very different, but still feeling very Call of Duty. And so it went from a game that I was excited about, you know, trying and maybe even picking up uh, if I weren't getting Battlefield because of you, um, to a game that's like, I'm glad I played this weekend. I kind of got my Call of Duty fix that I haven't really had in, you know, a couple of years now, but I'm okay not playing it still. It's still very much the, you need to be very cautious, you need to hide, you have people hiding in corners, you have to, you, you get up to these score streaks to get your, you know, your, your UAVs and your, you know, predator missile, whatever is they're called now, and you know, running around the map and everyone lone wolf. <sighs> yeah, <laughs> so there's good things and bad things. I, I I think myself included, I'm going to stop. I think Treyarch especially is really trying to push the boundaries on what a Call of Duty game is, and it's remarkable to me that they have all these systems in place and all these new guns and this futuristic setting. You can like wall run. There, you have a double jump where it's like a boost. You can run on walls, kind of like Titanfall style. Um, that they change up so much, but it still feels very fundamentally Call of Duty. Um, so I had a good time with it, but not a good enough time that I want to pick it up. I'm certainly not going to pick it up at this point. But yeah, man, because you're going to be buying Battlefield. We got to get our Star Wars on. Oh God! Please be excited. I did make I did make that freaking promise. Please be excited. 
I'm not excited. Yeah, again, uh, it's kind of fun. Again, in case anyone needed more proof for you know PS4, the games that I bought in for were Rocket League and Star Wars Battlefront. So, just saying. Maybe that just says something about my taste in games, but still. Let's just... <laughs> continue. Let's continue. Uh, so it's kind of interesting to play this Black Ops 3 beta in the context of my weekend, too, because I hung out with a friend uh, who I've mentioned before. He's uh, another PhD uh, candidate as well. He doesn't really – he has games, but he doesn't really play them. He's always just kind of in a one game a year, if that even. Uh, he plays Call of Duty. And so we so were playing again, some Call of Duty. not du- a person who needs to buy into the PS4? Uh, I mean, he wants to. He wants to for the new Call of Duty game. Um, and we played uh, some call, old school Call of Duty together. So we played Black Ops One together. Oh, that online. was a fun game. Uh, yeah, and then but playing it is so different because Black Ops One, the time to kill is so much slower than every other Call of Duty. And so where I was sucking kind of on the Black Ops Three beta, I was like still kicking ass on <laughs> the Black Ops <laughs> One. Like I got dog, like dogs kill streak. Oh, we got and, dogs. Chopper gunner and stuff. Oh, so. uh, and then we also played Call of Duty Ghosts, which was that much maligned Call of Duty game, the first one to come on PS4. It released the fall that PS4 came out. It was the kind of cross PS3, PS4. And it was... Ugh, it was whatever. It was very gray. Everything was gray. I couldn't even see anything that was happening. Uh, but yeah, it's just kind of contrasting that. Again, playing those older titles, and playing those newer titles, you can really see how... The innovations that they're they're making are insignificant, but it's still Call of Duty. So I played a lot else this week. I actually had a very full week of stuff, but we'll save more of that for Experimental Methods next time. Excellent. So yes, please be excited for Experimental Methods next time where Alex continues to show how all he does is game. <laughs> all I do is game, 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 no matter what. Got PS4 on my mind, I don't <laughs> ever give up. Okay, the most depressing <laughs> cover of that song now over. Is any errata you want to get to quickly, Fliss? Yeah, man. Uh, I just finished up watching Gundam 00, um, one of the more recent Gundam titles. Um, it's an anime series. It's two seasons, each one 25 episodes long. Um, it's It usually comes very highly recommended as a starter Gundam, like a good place to enter the franchise, get your feet wet with giant robots in anime. Uh, you've been talking about Galaxy on the podcast, and that definitely made me glad that I was getting my giant robot fix from Gundam, but I just finished watching Season 2. Um, it was pretty satisfying. It is definitely not my favorite of the Gundams, but I do agree that it's a good place to get in uh, to kind of as a good starter giant robot anime, mech anime, and also just as a good starter anime in general, because although it does have some of the tropes of anime none of them are particularly egregious and it it does innovate and have some really good interesting characters and actually surprisingly diverse cast of characters for an anime gundam wing forever best gundam anime i really like gundam wing i i really like gundam wing i'm not going to argue with you about gundam wing being great it's not my favorite again of the gundams gundam seed represent what? oh gundam seed uh but gundam, if you're looking if you're looking for a place to step into the world of mech shows, to step into the world of mech anime, or just anime in general, uh, Gundam 00 is a good place. It's a good place to start. It's a good place to get your feet wet. So that would be that would be my recommendation for anyone who needs more giant robots in their life. And really, don't we all? Yeah, who doesn't? Uh, I'll save my recommendation for next week. We got, we got a lot. We got a lot to, to go through. So let's wrap us up here. All right, well, hey, everybody. Thanks for hanging out. Thanks for uh, bearing with us while I was out on vacation. I'm glad to be back. I'll be playing more games. I will also, hopefully this week, be uh, streaming for the first time. What? On uh, on Twitch. So you, you can check me out there. I'm Darth Chipmunk on Twitch. I'll put a <laughs> link out. Um, and... Uh, you can uh, you can check me out there. Although I might uh, I might change that. I'll probably change that over to Fliss of the North Star. Um, That's a good idea. Yeah, keep it consistent. Um, you can find me on Twitter at at the C Fliss. That's at T H E C F L I S S. Um, please check out the uh, my Twitter feed. Uh, say hi. Uh, I've just tweeted out a bunch of pictures from my travels across Japan. I'll be tweeting out more. Um, also check out my blog Fliss of the North Star for my thoughts on pop culture, Japan, and more. The blog is still on hiatus. Um, until the start of September, which is next week, right? So we'll have a whole bunch of posts coming up talking about my adventures 
running through Japan, seeing all kinds of new places. I went everywhere. Kyoto, Nara, Himeji, Hiroshima, Tokyo, Mount Fuji, all over the place. Basically, all the Western Japan you could ever want. So come hang out and say hi. That's, again, flissofthenorthstar.blogspot.com. All right. It sounds good. Still teasing that teasing that blog. I, I can't wait. I can't wait. Uh, thank you, everyone, for spending some time with us today. Uh, I hope you liked the changes, the tweaks we've made. Please let us know. Give us some feedback. We always appreciate it. So if you're hearing this now, chances are you found it on our SoundCloud page at soundcloud.com slash the impact factor. That's all one word. Um, please give us a reblog or a favorite there. It really helps. And then also look us up on the iTunes store and subscribe to get direct downloads of the new episode each week. And that's each Friday, as I'm sure anyone who's listening to this will know. Uh, reading us there and writing a review will do a lot for us. Helps us with discoverability. Help more people find this little gem that is the impact factor. At least I hope it's a gem. Uh, speaking of iTunes review, we've got another one that I want to read today. This is from user DMP1080. Um, this is a five-star review, so thank you so much, DMP1080. Uh, and they write, Alex and Fliss have great perspectives on video games. They have helped me rediscover my passion for playing video games, and now I can't stop. Thanks, guys. Keep up the good work. You guys are the best and cute, too. Uh, so thanks, DMP, <laughs> for saying we're cute. Uh, maybe we got cute voices. I don't know what it is. Uh, so thank you so much. It's a five-star review, DMP1080. Thank you so much for the review. Um, so for an archive of our old episodes, check us out on YouTube by searching the Impact Factor Video Games. That's the Impact Factor is an extension of my blog about video games. That's the impactfactor.blogspot.com. Check there every Tuesday for a new review or article, and every Friday for my curation of the best written pieces from the world of gaming. This week, I have a review, like Fliss mentioned earlier, about uh, of Titan Souls, the game by Asinerve on the PS Vita. Uh, so send any comments and suggestions for the podcast to impactfactorpodcast at gmail.com. Follow me on Twitter at Alex Samoha. That's Alex S-A-Mocha, like the coffee. And until next time, make an impact.